Bum, 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 bum. Thank you. Last Outrider here, and I'm thinking of changing my channel name now to Arch Inquisitor. That's actually another common handle that I had because I am making a bridging video to bring me from just talking about 40k topics into, by popular demand, common topics, current events, any type of TV shows, anything that crosses my alcohol idled brain in the middle of the night, I might come in here and drunk video. Not really. But I think you understand what I mean. Yeah, thank you. Now, I'm gonna start out by talking about why did I like 40K? Some people had questions about this from the last video. And this actually started out in bringing up some of the other major changes that occurred in 40K over the years. Uh, other than the whole uh, hate thing, there, there, there's a number of them. One of the things that I, uh, that kind of, you know, puts a hair up my ass is, is the, the return of the Primarchs. Because one of the main aspects of 40K was the religiosity, the religious fanaticism of the Imperium. Now, Gilliman comes back and is horrified by the Imperium. I understand that. But if he is horrified by the Imperium, how much more horrified would he be by the Ultramarines? Try to remember, the term battle brother, or brother in general, was not a familial term in 40K. It was a religious title. The chapters were brotherhoods, cloisters, fortress monasteries. I think everybody remembers these terms. The space marines were religious orders with their individual cults of the emperor each one having their own aspect of worshiping the emperor, which was accepted grudgingly by the ecclesiarchy. Do we remember any of this? I do. Uh, Space Marines Day was spent in preparation and prayer. Constant prayers and religious rites dedicated to the emperor. How many times in the earlier books would you have, whenever they wanted to call up a space marine, the first answer would always be, why did you disturb my prayers, asshole? You don't hear that anymore in books. That's what they did. They were either praying or killing in the name of the emperor. Killing the imperial enemies was a religious right. It was the holy wrath of the emperor made manifest, and they were his angels. They still refer to that a few times, although now it's more metaphorically, but then it was literal. The bolter was the emperor's wrath. Flamers the Holy Trinity, they even call it that. Bolter, Flamer, Melta. This wasn't a joke. So, to shorten that video, imagine what Robert Gilliman's reaction would be to seeing the Ultramarines in daily prayer. I, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there was a chaplain corps when when he was put into stateless, stasis. So what would he make of them? Much less 
they're they're doing their their rights, their daily running, the daily rights for the space marines, the indoctrinization. What what relationship does Gilliman have with the chapter's chief chaplain? I would love to know. I'd love to see the conversation between those two. How long would it take for him to be declared a heretic? Not just by the chaplaincy, but by just even the standard battle brother who he, he, he must detest by judging by his reactions. There is no way he could wake up every single day. And I'm, the first thing they would want him to do would be to lead a religious uh, ceremony. And when he says, what, you freaking morons, emperor, huh? I'm not going to do that. I couldn't see them following him. But hey, that again shows you how much 40K has changed. Now, back on to my bridging topics. Um, why did I like 40K? Well, to be honest with you, at the time I started playing 40K, I was actually playing two games for a, pretty much the same reason. One of them is all but, in fact, I think it is officially dead in all but name, Starfleet Battles. Yes, the only game that I know of that you could actually get a degree in its rules. Yeah. I mean, the, the, those were the two games. I, you basically had two backpacks to go play. One filled with your 40K books, the other filled with uh, my Starfleet Battle books and binders. Yes, I still have my hat. It's right here in case you missed it. I just forgot. Um, yeah, for Starfleet Battles was some heated arguing stuff. If you, those were two games, you best have a thick skin and, and just loved, and maybe that was the fun of it. Maybe that's what I liked. But what I liked about 40K is it was an end times game. And as far as I can see, the only one that ever existed. I mean, we had post-apocalyptic games, of which at that time I remember playing Paranoia, if you remember that one. That was fun. Um, also, there was the D&D &D version. Ugh. There was Travelers, and there was, what is that? Something Zone. There was a futuristic version, a science fiction version of, of Dungeons and Dragons that I was also playing. Gamma World. Yes, that was it. How many people remember that? Uh, I guarantee you TSR doesn't. But 40K wasn't post-apocalyptic. 40K was the day of the apocalypse. The last day of the 41st millennium is the end of humanity. Um, it's over. This is the end game. Uh, there is no success. There is no future. This is we shall not go quietly into the night times okay this is done humanity has run its course and had its golden age and this is the end and it's going out fighting humanity wasn't going to defeat chaos it didn't think it would chaos is eternal but it could as hell kill every single traitor they are not eternal um and that's what it was. This was the end times. You were playing the end times. That's what I liked about it. And that's why it could be that brutal kind of world. Uh, because there was no future. So you had nothing to lose. The only question was is, how did you want to die? 
because this is it. Um, that's obviously a distant memory, but that's what I enjoyed about it, and that's gone. Now, uh, hell, Star Trek Discovery is more grim, dark than 40K in many aspects. The Terran Empire in Star Trek Discovery is closer to 40K than 40K is to 40K today. That's funny. That is some funny stuff. Even Rogel Dorn would laugh at that shit. Now, um, so what do, wh why did I like that? Because I see us pretty much in the end times now. And I, you know, when I say end times, I am not speaking in a biblical sense, so please don't go nutty on me. I'm just talking about we have hit our peak as a species. Um, and it's it, we're really getting to the point where it's going to be downhill from here. People ask me about uh, my politics. So now in an in 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 in-person situation, politics is a far more common uh, topic for me than 40K. And a lot of people apparently like asking me about that too. Especially the more and more of what I've said seems to be coming true. So they have more and more questions, especially when all the people who said I was wrong. Now, Trump or not Trump, UK, EU, Brexit, Australia, Asia, I've been to all of these places. I can sum up my thoughts about the EU with a single idea. Any country that spends a significant portion of its budget, GDP, to support a vestigial, useless royal family deserves everything that's coming for it. And it's not going to be pretty. And I'm talking about all of them because they exist in all parts of the world. They're just dead countries walking and they don't know it. Um, and don't even, if, if anybody who wants to argue about that, I'm like, okay, believe what you want to believe. I don't care. I'm just telling you my analysis. <sighs> the U.S.? <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Um, Trump is, to me, and, and this is what I, people seem to think they know my politics. Nobody knows my politics at all because I haven't told anybody them. So unless they can read my mind, uh, they don't know. The only thing I tell people when they ask me what my politics are is, if you want to know my politics, let me tell you my politics. If my politics came true, you would beg to be living under Putin, possibly even want to go vacationing in North Korea because I live in a data-driven world, okay? And my politics would be be based upon best practices, based upon data, and based upon the realities of the world that we are in. And you would not like that one bit. But I can give you clues. Um, I love Brave New World. I have no idea why people see that as a dystopian future. Because from what I can see, if Brave New World was any more accurate, it would be freaking prophecy. I mean, I had one time wrote some nice... I'm not gonna, maybe you can call it fan fiction. I don't know. But I basically rebooted Brave New World to update the technology. Now you may not know this, but Brave New World was written back in the 1920s, okay? In an age pre-DNA. 
much less pre-computers. It's amazing when you read it, but it's true. So if you were to update Brave New World and you went through that whole process that's described in the first chapter of the book, but this time used genetic engineering and the knowledge that we have uh, about DNA, um, it's spot on to what everybody would love to be doing at this point in time. Um, if you look at the the consumerism, the 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 what is it? Creative destruction. That was that was an that literally was a, a, a popular economic idea going through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But I have no idea why that was looked at as a dystopian future. I don't think Aldous Huxley meant it as a dystopian future. Uh, 1984 was more of a red scare book than it was a warning about the future. It was, it was an allegory about what was happening with the Soviet Union of the time. And 1984 was never a world view. What do you mean? What do I mean? Did you read the book? I'm guessing the number of people who think of and talk about 1984 probably have never read more than the title. Because there was a great statement in that book which says that they're really only talking about 15 to 20% of the world's population in 1984. Uh, uh, um, Insock? You remember they asked, he asked O'Brien in, in near the end, I don't know where, it's been so long since I read it, but he was asking what, what a, uh, uh, when, when O'Brien was saying he had a near treasonous thought of um, when he was talking about the new, new double speak, new English, new language, that it would be impossible to even uh, think about um, treason or, or freedom or any of these other thoughts because they would, the words would be literally removed from the language. Nobody would be able to express this thought except, and then he hesitated because he realized he was going to say something that was seditious, except the probes, the, 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 you know, the people who were not a member of the party at all. But then he just dismissed that by saying, uh, those aren't human beings. We don't hear anything about those people. All we know is that they make up 80% of the population. 80% of the population is not a part of INSOC, and INSOC doesn't give a flying fuck what happens to them, and doesn't even look at them as people. So all of this 1984 society really only affects 20% of the population. And we have no, not a single comment really about the other 80% other than they suck and their lives suck. So if you're going to look at the death of freedom and everything like that, it was like, well, death of freedom for 20% inner party and outer party members and everybody else, who knows what they're doing. I'm going to break this video now into two parts because who wants to sit around and watch a 40 minute video and I will come back and finish my thoughts. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>